great British explorer, George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said, because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Zero. We have commit. We have. We have lift off. You're going to get a chance, the only place in the world that you can go and see the space race between the Americans and the Russians uh, and our new cooperative efforts laid out side by side and see actual artifacts from both. If you haven't been to the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center, you are missing out. There are artifacts here you won't find anywhere else in the world. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You begin your tour by looking at these rare rockets. And the V2 that you see here and the V1 over on this side are the only originals in America. So in the other place that you're going to see them outside of Germany is in the Imperial War Museum in London. This one came from Germany in 1945. It was constructed in February. We know that for certain because we've got the quality control documentation for it over here. And the uh, V1 came from uh, Germany in 1945 as well. So. As Chris said, one of the other amazing experiences this museum offers is a side-by-side -side comparison of the U.S.-Russian space race. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good. Over. Roger, copy. Well, one of the neat things about the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center, um, one of the special things about us, is that we have the largest collection of Russian space artifacts outside of Moscow. And even if you went to Russia, you still wouldn't get to see what you see here. All the spacecraft and artifacts are at the Rocket Space Corporation Energia, not open to the public. So this is, you're going to see more Russian space artifacts here than in any other museum in the world. Major Andrian Nikolayev follow in the footsteps of two other Russian astronauts, Titov and Gagarin, and thus give the Soviets four manned orbital flights against two for the United States. This is obviously not the original Sputnik because that burned up on re-entry, but they built a number of engineering models for it and backups. This is a backup for Sputnik. And the backup to Sputnik 2, the first craft to launch a living creature, is here too, right across from it. The, in this area is the beginnings of the U.S. and the Russian space program. So, and compared side by side, you see a Russian Vostok spacecraft on this side, which is the same spacecraft that launched Yuri Gagarin in space. This is a flown Vostok spacecraft, the only one that you'll see anywhere outside of uh, Russia. And right across from it on the U.S. side, you've got Liberty Bell 7, which was the second U.S. space launch with Gus Grissom. The Liberty Bell 7 actually belongs to the Cosmosphere. It's the only spacecraft that's not owned by the Air and Space Museum and the Cosmosphere owns it because when it went to be salvaged off the bottom of the ocean, the agreement was Discovery Channel um, and the Cosmosphere, that the Discovery Channel would fund bringing it up. We would do the restoration on it, they would take it on tour, and then we would get it in the end. And just beyond the Liberty Bell 7 is the Gemini 10. So, which was one of the Gemini missions which followed on after Mercury. So you're seeing all those original Mercury and Gemini, all that 1960s, um, all those, the, 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 the original spacefaring times. Hey, we've got a problem here. What did you do? This is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. This is the actual Apollo 13. After it came back from its mission, uh, NASA had considered it a failure. So it was a successful failure because they saved the crew, but it still was a failure in their minds. But the spacecraft had been through a lot, cold, wet on the inside, et cetera. So they took out 80,000 pieces of equipment from the inside of it, sent it back to the original manufacturers for testing. In the middle 1990s, uh, it was kind of recognized that this national treasure was out there, and so an effort was, was begun by the Cosmosphere with the State Department and NASA. They brought back the spacecraft, and then the Cosmosphere went on a research project to find all of those original 80,000 pieces. And now it's considered the most original of all of the flown Apollo spacecraft because we have pedigree for everything that came that went out and went back into this spacecraft. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. This museum does more than just show you artifacts. It fixes them up too. It's the only location designated by the Smithsonian Institution to restore spacecraft. When the Cosmosphere started doing that, uh, nobody was even thinking about restoration. The spacecraft were all relatively new. Yes, they'd flown in space, but they were all relatively new. 
It's a good thing the experts at the Cosmosphere saw that need and then decided to fill it. Spacecraft and spacesuits and space hardware would come here as either loans or purchases or whatever, you know, however else we uh, acquired them through donations, etc. And we would take a look at it and if something needed some work, we would start working on it. Literally, it was learned on the, on the fly. You had to get all the plans, had to get all the diagrams, had to talk to people who'd worked on them originally, etc. And so we started learning the art of spacecraft restoration uh, and just built up the skills over time to the point where now we are the recognized experts. Since the experts here restore spacecraft, they can also make their own. If you can restore something, you can reproduce it. So we also build reproductions of space hardware, um, space suits, spacecraft, etc. So, and does that do you supply most of those to museums or movies or how do, yes? Where do they go? Is the answer to that one. So yeah, the uh, um, we build them. We've built them for museums. We've built them for private collectors. We've built them for the Hollywood film industry to use um, in uh, in movies and TV shows. Every bit of hardware that you see in the movie Apollo 13 was made by the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center for Tom Hanks and, and Ron Howard to use. So the spacesuits that you see, the spacecraft that you see, the tools, everything that you see was made by the Cosmosphere. This museum not only has unique and rare displays, its goal is to teach and educate. You've got a planetarium where you can sit and relax under the stars. Everyone knows that You can pay a visit to Dr. Goddard's lab where learning is never boring. If you're afraid of the dark, hold someone's hand. If you're afraid of fire, you should be in the IMAX. The IMAX theater here was actually one of the first in the world. The serial number on our projector is number 12, so when I mean, we were the fifth in the United States, so the second domed theater in the United States. So how did this world-class museum come to be located here in Hutchinson, Kansas? Patty Carey was the heart and soul of everything, and I'm, I'm so sad that I never got a chance to meet her. She was the heart and soul of the Cosmosphere. Um, she was the heart and soul of the Hutchinson Planetarium. It was due to her, and you know, she was the one who walked around and talked to people and got them to come on board as volunteers, as uh, fundraisers, as staff members, as everything. So she, she did it all. Amateur astronomer Patricia Brooks Carey first opened the Hutchinson Planetarium back in 1962. She was down in Oklahoma City visiting relatives and had visited the planetarium there and found out that they were selling their old star projector system and the dome that went over it because they were upgrading their system. Within a few days, she managed to raise the $7,200 they were asking for it. Despite the fact she raised that much money, the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center had a rather humble beginning. And installed it, I kid you not, in the chicken coop, the poultry barn at the state fairgrounds. In 1967, the uh, Hutchinson Community College was building a new science building. And so they decided to put a planetarium in as part of that. The logical um, thing was to that for them to invite the Hutchinson Planetarium to move from the state fairgrounds in the poultry barn over to the new science building, which they did, and opened up here in 1967. Then in the 1970s, the board of directors decided it was time to expand. By then, the planetarium had also started collecting objects, so that's when it officially became a museum. The mid-90s brought another major expansion, which brought the Cosmosphere to what you see today. Um, yeah, it really is just, uh, it was a testament to what that one key uh, person can do in any organization, so. That's the truth, no doubt. Because of the people who believed in the dreamer, that dream has continued to expand. Okay, so um, we've got about 15,000 artifacts in the collection all total. Um, Smithsonian, interestingly enough, when you take a look at the Air and Space Museum, about 15,000 artifacts in their collection as well. So, um, and we're in the middle of 100% inventory right now where we're digitizing picture-wise everything. Um, Although this museum has incredible displays, one of the most fascinating places here is a part you don't see. As any museum does, uh, we've got a collection that is bigger than what you can see. Only 7% of our collections on display in the museum. Loan items out to other museums um, to 
corporations and things like that to put on display temporarily, et cetera. So we do a lot of that sort of work. But, you know, you saw the Russian glove. Well, here's the inside of, here's a U.S. space glove. Now, if it was on the moon or anywhere like that, you would have a white cover over the top of this one. But this was a training glove, and you probably should recognize that name. I do. So, Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin so. And when you see the huge number of artifacts in this museum, that's almost impossible to believe. Uh, we've got uh, an environmentally controlled area where we have a lot of our small items. So in there you'll see spacesuits, in there you'll see gloves, hardware, toys, documents, um, uh, items that were taken out of spacecrafts, you name it, it's down there. Here we pull out, and at this point in time they were building a survival kit for Gus Grissom to use. This is the second U.S. launch, so the, they had a match holder in there in the survival kit. It's just a Boy Scout match holder, you know, and it's tough to see, but if you look in the reflection there, you can see the Boy Scout emblem. Another part of the Cosmosphere most people don't see is the future astronaut training program. You have to pre-register to take part in these classes. You've got six days, residential, and they learn everything about how do we get a space shuttle off the ground, what makes it run, how do you operate it, etc. Their final exam is they are inside the, our space shuttle simulator and they fly a whole mission. Countdown, launch, uh, orbital insertion. Uh, they then do a launch a satellite, and then they uh, do a deorbit burn, a reentry, and a landing. They also get the opportunity to ride a G4 simulator. Can, they will be pulling four Gs in here, so they will be feeling four times the Earth's gravity when they're spinning around in the inside of here. So, students also get the opportunity to plan a mission to Mars, sitting at Mission Control, and learn to pinpoint their location while under stress. Okay, the backward's not so fun. <laughs> because of all the wonderful programs they have, this museum is almost self-supporting. We're able to fund uh, over 80% of our budget uh, from in-house sources. And Four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. With 14% coming from the city and the rest from private donors. With such a long history of space expertise, they couldn't have found a better person to take up Patty Carey's dream and run with it. You have loved space for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, that I grew up in Downey, California, um, which is also where my wife grew up, by the way, uh, which is where they built the Apollo spacecraft and the uh, space shuttle. So some of my early memories are my mom taking me out to when the astronauts would come back from Apollo 11, 12, 13, 14. They always came back to Downey as a thank you gesture to the workers there at the plant that built the Apollo command module that took them to the moon. This is a newspaper clipping of Chris reaching up to shake John Young's hand when Chris was only eight years old. Little did he know that was preparing him for the job he was going to undertake in the future. I uh, read a lot of biographies and some of them were of the astronauts and so I learned quite a bit about the space program just um, through, through reading quite a bit. So coming to this position, I knew quite a bit about the space program and have always loved it. It's one of the great success stories of the United States. And Chris's dream is to continue to expand this museum. The next project is to add artifacts from Mars exploration. That's our goal, you know, is to, is to uh, uh, honor the achievements of the past and inspire the future of space exploration.